everyone, I am uh, Matt Siegel with A Brother's Revival, and this is David Rook Goldflees. With A Brother's Revival. With A brother, Brother's Revival. Uh, so, welcome everyone uh, that's tuning in from uh, Newberry Opera House's uh, Facebook Live. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the show. Uh, I'm going to play interview, ask David some questions. <laughs> hey, sorry about the... Uh the uh we call it the failed start this, af <laughs> this afternoon on the first video kind of technically challenged i guess and that at least when it comes to facebook videos so if you're here now welcome definitely definitely so uh first off brothers revival we are playing at newberry opera house on friday october 8th yep so if you haven't got your tickets yet there are still some available so uh do that we start at eight o'clock and um so uh let's start off with some of the basics david how did A Brother's Revival get started? Ah, A Brother's Revival got started, uh, well really we had a band before that, Matt and I had a band called the Allman Goldfleece Band with a buddy of ours named Gary Allman. And so um, along with Joe Weiss, the other guitar player, we had this band that was already playing a lot of the Brothers material and some original material. Uh, and then we got a phone call from a gentleman up in New Jersey who turned out to be an agent and thought, you know, I think I could do something with a band that really, really... Uh, not just covers the music, but really brings life to the Allman Brothers music. So we said, that sounds interesting. We were already doing like 80% of that show. And so we put that band together, and uh, the rest is history. At least until we stopped last year when the whole country <laughs> shut down for a year and a quarter. But right. we're, we're making new history. That's right. That's right. And talk about history. Um, we uh, obviously have a common thread. Yeah, I got to come in a little bit more. Yeah. yeah. Uh, there is a, a thread that runs from a Brothers Revival to the Allman Brothers, given that you played in the Allman Brothers from the years of 79 to 82, 83? Yeah, something like that. Okay. Uh, it's a soft entry into Dickie Betts' band called uh, Great Southern Band. Uh, Dickie Betts and Great Southern. Kind of a soft entry into the Brothers world at that point. Because when Dickie, um, Danny Toller came into a gig and said, Hey, Dickie Betts is looking for a bass player. I said, That's great. Who's Dickie Betts? Um, but I quickly found out and um, got the gig, and it started out in Dickie's band. And then the Allman Brothers reformed, I believe it was in the uh, middle of 79, and about four years of playing with them at that point. A long time ago. Right. A long time ago. Right. But it leads us to today. And then, uh, Directly. You played on how many albums with them? Uh, three albums, three. and one with Dickie. I mean, Atlanta's burning down with Dickie's band. Nice, nice. And yeah. you did receive, you have a gold album for one of them? I or? do, right over there, yeah. Yeah, we've got up on the wall there and nominated for a Grammy for Pegasus, an instrumental. Yeah, um, I guess the best rock instrumental is a nomination for it. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, so, um, you know what's funny, Matt? Yeah. When you're young, I was young, I was 20 years old. Yeah. And you don't realize that um, that's a really special thing when you're 20 years old. It's like, oh, another day, another day in the life. Looking back now, that's like, wow, can't believe that even happened. Yeah. I mean, really, it's like out of the blue. Things were so easy when you're young. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's been a while, I think, for both of us since we were young. Indeed, so, indeed. Yeah. indeed. Um, but that actually leads to, to my next question. Do you uh, remember a specific like moment or event when you were in the Brothers uh, that really just stands out for you that was maybe something special that you look back on? Oh, yeah, because yeah, I've thought about this before. And, at, and again, at the time, it wasn't a big deal. Didn't really think of anything of it. Looking back now, it was clearly one of the most uh, interesting events that happened. And I, it was on the first album, uh, Enlightened Roads, uh, working with Tom Dowd. And I didn't realize Tom Dowd was like a root directory for like most of the music that made, at least for me, a lot of the music of the 20th century. All the way from John Coltrane to Leonard Skinner, the Allman Brothers. Uh, started Atlantic Records, and I got to work with this guy who gave me pointers on playing better bass lines on the album. It doesn't sound like a huge thing, but then you think, who's telling you that? It's Tom Dowd. Yeah. So that really stood out. You know, here many, many years later, like, man, I got a chance to work with one of the 20th century's finest producers. So that's the kind of thing that would be around the Elmer Brothers Band. Again, didn't really have a deep appreciation. Um, I just published an article on Medium where I talk about how it took me 38 years, 40 years to kind of come to grips with some of the ideas and exposure that I had to understand, like the articles about fans. And, right. and really understanding how people really connect to the community around the Allman Brothers. And, and the fans are really important. 
you know, to carrying it on, and also at our shows. And people come up and they tell you, hey man, I saw the band and this happened, and I smoked a joint with the roadie or whatever, you know, and like they just are so into it. And after a while, I just started realizing that everybody owns a little piece of the band, you know, including myself, including you. We each have these experiences. And when I posted that article on Medium, I started getting uh, comments of people who knew me and said, oh, I had an experience with a guy from the Allen Brothers. Like, he, he installed my internet. <laughs> so I had an internet company. So, I mean, it was just so fun how the, uh, the chain just continues and continues and continues, you know. Right. So that's another inter interesting thing about the band, too, is that the community is so wide and still so deep and so heartfelt by so many people that I just love after the show, people come up to get merch and tell us what they thought about the show. Generally good things. Yes. Generally good. And um, then they tell us their story. And it's the most interesting stuff I've ever heard, I think. Definitely, definitely. So let's talk a little bit more about uh, the show. Uh, so oh yeah, the show. The show runs how long approximately? It this varies, it varies. Two hours and 15 minutes, uh, two and a half hours, depends. Some venues you have to kind of cut a little short for whatever reasons. Uh, but about two hours and 15 minutes, I'd say. And now this tour, we're doing the, the, last, the last half of the show or the second set, depending on how it's broken up. We're doing the At Fillmore East uh, album, like in the original order, original keys, original arrangements. Uh, even Matt introduces the song with the, with the uh, errors in the, <laughs> in the name. We just try to make it as real as possible, still uh -huh. being ourselves. but. It's fun, so we're doing the At Fillmore East album in the show. The first half of the show is like songs that you kind of know and love, like Ramblin' Man, Melissa, Midnight Rider. Uh, it's just quite a few. Whereas the second half has some like that too. They're just different. Uh, Hot Lana, Elizabeth Reed, Whipping Post. And I won't go into what the encore is right now. We'll save yeah, that. No, no sense. No you got to come to the show for that, right? Indeed. Indeed. <laughs> that's great. So, um, and that's uh, to celebrate the 50th anniversary of that album, right? Yeah Matt, yeah, Matt texted me one day and said, hey, it was a couple years ago, hey, it's the 50th anniversary of the Fillmore East album, we should do something. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and this last summer we did the Midwest Ramble Tour. He started naming our tours, which I thought was kind of cool. Thank uh, so I was going to get tacos in Bonifay, Florida, and I thought, you know, here's the fall, and it's the Fillmore, you know, Matt had told me about the Fillmore uh, thing, and I said, oh, well, let's, let's do the fall Fillmore Tour. So when you come to our show, which we hope you do, we will do the uh, fall, Fillmore tour, uh, premiering the at, at Fillmore East album. Perfect. See, Matt is a total fan. See, this is the thing about Matt. He's not just the guitar player. We met Matt, we uh, were looking for a guitar player to play the second parts, like the Dwayne stuff. And so um, we found this guy on Craigslist, yeah. and he said, yeah, looking you know, guitar is looking for a band to play Alma Brothers music. So we got him, and it's like, I said, Matt, I think you've struck the jackpot. After we heard him play, we were like, yeah, this guy will work out. Uh, and that was a whole process too. But here we are now, and Matt is a tremendous guitar player, but, he, but a complete fan. He's, he comes to it from a fan point of view. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, to build on that, uh, I think one of the, the pleasures for me is that, you know, there are times where we're on stage and I'm like, you know, I'm playing next to the guy that was in the band. And uh, we have, you know, Mike Koch in the band, who we'll talk about in a moment. And it's just such an honor, and you know, uh, to play this music that I've loved from a young age on with, you know, the people who are, you know, really part of it. And and it's just enjoyable for me. It's like I'm also at the concert myself, even though I'm part of the show. You know. So so, so, Matt, uh, so Matt is both parts. Yeah. He's a fan. He's also a player. So he owns a. I would say owns a little more than the average person of the Allen Brothers band, but still just a, just one of the many shareholders. That's right. right. That's right. We all got a little piece. Along of with it. you know millions of other people, right. each have their own little tiny piece that is like their perspective on the band. Yeah. Uh, taken as a whole, it's an astounding uh, cultural um, phenomenon, really. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. It really is. Um, hey man, look at this. There's like a list of people. I know. This I is know. awesome. It's really great that y'all are joining us. Um, so let's talk about Mike Koch for a moment. Let's so talk about Mike. Let's talk about Mike. So Mike uh, is from the Dickie Betts uh, band for the past... Dickie Betts and Great Southern, Great Southern. and Dickie Betts, right. right. So for the past 15 years. And how did that come about? Or do you, or do you just want to talk about Mike and what he brings to the table? Well, or? Uh, we were looking for a new, a new vocalist and a keyboard player uh, when we transferred into this band. And uh, through our agent, 
uh, a friend of his said, hey man, what about that guy Mike Koch? I said, I don't know Mike Koch, what about him? So he connected us up together, and Mike's a super nice guy, uh, great talent, and I've recently had two weeks on the road with him, where we've, it was the first time we've ever done that. We've been on the road with the band, but it's usually fly in, do a couple dates, fly home. In the last two weeks, we actually went to New Hampshire, played a couple gigs together, then he came down here and stayed at the house. And so I got to hang out with Mike, and Mike is like, was Dickie Betts' Greg Allman, the best way to say it. He has this great southern drawl, this uh, bluesy intensity. I mean, it's fantastic vocalist, incredible keyboard player. But when you hang out with Mike, he's from, it sounds like he's from New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> or Connecticut, to yeah, be more Connecticut, accurate. Really, to be right. more accurate. Right. But yeah, I, I'm hanging, and like we were in Boston, you know, he's like, has the accent down perfectly. And it's like, yeah, when I talk to my dad, he says, you know, I go right back into that accent. And he's like, then how do you sing this Southern stuff? That's right. It's so great. It's just so great to hang out with Mike. And uh, unbelievable player, unbelievable musician, really. Yeah. Just a great musician. Um, the least of my worries on this planet is, is Mike coming on stage and playing. Always gives it his best. Always, always just plays fantastic. He's just, um, I mean, everybody has ups and downs. Mike is 100% consistent. Sits down and just plays it. And as much as we work on the monitors and the stage set and the lighting and all that, in the end it doesn't matter. Mike sits down and does that music. Uh, every show is pretty much definitive for Mike, I find. Yeah. That's what I found. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. He's great. Yeah. So um, are there any points uh, in the night that you have really maybe particularly enjoyed? That, you know, so any special moments for you when we play these shows? Anything that comes to mind? Well, there's a couple things, actually, now that you mention it. Uh, well, um, the former guitar player, Joe Weiss, and I have this moment in one of the songs where we do what's called the Jessica Fantasy. And we kind of made that up, and it's not like in the original Allman Brothers, but on the other hand, it's, it's me playing bass in a certain way, a little bit different. Uh, and for those who are into bass, Jocko influenced. And with Joe doing a very impressionistic, yet faithful rendition of Jessica, completely out of time. Uh, it's called Rubato those following along at home and um, that's a real special moment that's just totally in the moment we make it up every night it's never the same um, it's completely improvised we have some parameters but we stay within those and within that it can be whatever happens and it's really a neat moment uh, another one that comes to mind is my fiddle tune yeah, yeah I like it it's called fiddle it's got a melody whoops better turn it up and tighten my bow That's kind of a fun moment. We break the setup uh, with this and uh, with some like di having a different instrument kind of breaks up the set a little bit. And it's a fun tune. Uh, people seem to always respond very well to it. And that's off the uh, Second Chance album with the Almond Goldflees band. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's one cool, couple cool moments right there. Nice, nice. And you know, I kind of always consider that I call that a palate cleanser. A palate you know, cleanser. You know, like uh, because yeah, we're you know playing this really intense Almond Brothers music. You know all these you know heavy guitar solos and all this great stuff and it's like we just change it up for a moment just for a moment mm -hmm. and then we go back to it but it's a great moment in the show I think yeah and I went on after the Allman Brothers and actually brought back fiddle playing which um I had started with playing with my grandfather when I was like four years old classical music only uh, but it's kind of stuck around I got this really cool cantini this is a MIDI violin a little wireless on there today uh, from the electric violin shop up in um, Raleigh, or actually in Durham, North Carolina. Uh, hopefully when we're up there, I'll get a chance to stop in and say hello and, and pick around on some other instruments. It's, it's a very dangerous place to walk in, <laughs> let me tell you. Uh, yeah, so, um, yeah, I just love the instrument. Another moment that I really like, though, um, I do play in, but not so much, is we have a timpani solo. Uh, Butch Trucks had, um, would come off the drums, I think it was in Pegasus, we did a like a dual drum solo, and then he would come off the drums and play timpani, and do a, a rock timpani solo. And so uh, we've recreated that. Um, I remember I had the flu, and I was laying in bed, 
and really sick. And I was thinking, if we're gonna do this, we've gotta recreate the, the, the Timpani solo. So Joe and I got in the van, I was just starting to get better from the flu and drove all the way to north of Atlanta from the Gulf and uh, bought two timpani and came back. I felt horrible, <laughs> but we had to have timpani. There we go. And those are the timpani you will see at the show. Yes. But we, we brought that back. Butch Trucks, um, after he passed away, I just thought that was a very special and unique thing. Maybe someone else is doing it. I know that I had to do it because I had done so many onstage moments with Butch, doing him doing timpani and me doing bass. I thought that'd be something very unique and special and, uh, and completely honoring Butch's idea right there because um, Butch was a neat cat to hang out with. A very, very level-headed, very focused. Hmm. Yeah, really had a great time hanging out with Butch. We used to room together. We were at some place for less than a day. We roomed together and I got to hang out and see like, his plans for his studio and uh, hear about his kids, his wife, you know, every, you know, all this stuff. The kids were little bitty kids back then. Right, right. You know, they've all grown up. but. Yes. Um, but anyway, so that's another really interesting moment, I think, for me in the show, because it has an actual, it came from working with Butch directly from working with Butch. Nice, nice. A um, couple more questions, and I think we'll wrap up. So um, you mentioned earlier that you started on violin, right? I did. So, um, and this could be about violin or bass, but um, why don't you talk about your influences musically a little bit? Oh, wow. Yeah. Well, real quick, the first influences I can remember were like uh, the Archies. Oh, wow. I okay. love the Archies. <laughs> and the Monkees. They were fantastic. Yeah. Loved it. Uh, and then um, the, my class, classical music was always around. And there was a symphony. My, my dad had a music store. My grandfather had a music store where they had records. And you'd go in and put little headphones on and listen to the records. And there was a uh, Lalo, is a composer, he wrote a thing called Symphony Espanol. And I remember hearing that violin melody and just completely being turned on by it. Like, oh my God, that is the coolest music. So that kind of kept me connected to the violin. Uh, and then my sister brought home a Led Zeppelin album. And I really thought that was like the worst music I'd ever heard. <laughs> I was 10 years old. Like, that sounds terrible, Beth. What is that noise? Stop that. But two years later, I put the same album on. I think it was the one with the big Zeppelin on it. Oh, Zeppelin like, 1. 1, yeah. yeah. And, I, man, it was so good. It's like, oh, my God, I can't believe how good that album is. Uh, and so uh, I said to Dad, I want to play guitar, Dad, because listen to those great guitars. And Dad says, no, nah, you don't want to play guitar. I said, I don't? He says, no. Um, what you want to play is bass, because there's no good bass players. And bass is a cool instrument. And I had no idea about that. I said, okay, whatever. And I played my dad's band for a little while. Uh, and as they say, the rest is history. The rest is history. But then there was, I was growing up, and I was hanging out in my hometown, uh, skipping school, doing what you do. And uh, went to a little place called Mac and Joe's. And they had a little band called Jive Soup playing there. It was a jazz group made of college kids from Miami University. And I remember I walked in, I was too young to be in there, and I think the keyboard player just played like a minor nine chord on a Fender Rhodes and stereo through a huge PA. And I just like, my jaw just dropped. I never heard anything so beautiful. So that started a whole expo, you know, a whole thing into jazz. It was wow. just going down that route of Miles Davis at that point, Herbie Hancock, you know, Bitches Brew in a silent way. Uh, kind of where fusion was starting to happen. Uh, and we'll, I, this, we'll get done with this quickly, but then there's one more really, there's, there's a thousand influences, but critical one was Bill Jeffries, played in my, a guy from school's band, and he um, taught me about bass, he taught me about strings, he taught me about pickups, he taught me about amplifiers, Chris Squire and the Sun Coliseum amplifiers and round wound strings, but more to the point, they did a lot of Allman Brothers material. And he taught me all about Barry Oakley, and Olympic bases and just that whole world. And without Bill, there's no way I, I would have had the awareness to progress into actually playing with the Allman Brothers. And it always blows his mind. You know, like I was the one who got the gig playing in the band. That's nice. Because yeah. it was because it was his idol. He just and he knew everything. He knew everything. Oh wow. So those are early influences. After that came people like Dickie Betts, Bill Bartlett from um, Starstruck, which was Ram Jam, uh, innumerable great jazz players, Miles Oslin from the um, uh, Professor of Jazz Studies at University of Kentucky. I mean, the list just goes on from there. But the early influences kind of set the stage of where you're going to pay attention to. Uh, and now, more recently, I play in orchestras and um, you know, influences such as Tchaikovsky and um, John Adams. Nice. List. Um, nice bass right here. This guy right here. Beautiful. <laughs> Can you hear it? it sounds great. It sounds great. It so, which you mentioned uh, Starstruck and Ram Jam. A uh, little, you know, or a, a little side fact about little side you. Side factoid. Yeah, a is factoid. that you played bass on what song? 
uh, Black Betty. Black Betty. Um, I was coming back with a friend of mine, Jim Ward from um, Tallahassee, getting my, my instruments worked on with, at a luthier over there. Um, and we went into a, a subway and I heard Black Betty. Whoa, Black Betty, bam, bam. I said, that's me playing. And the guy said, do you want mayo or not? <laughs> You know, so it, it played, and then we went and sat down, ate the sandwich, and it played again. So I knew I had made it because I was on a, a constant loop in Bluntstown, Florida, at a subway. There you go. But that song is actually like the most played song I've ever played on, and that includes yeah. anything by the Allman Brothers too. I mean, yeah. it's just an outlier, but it's an amazing hit record. And you hear it like you know at sporting events. I mean, it's really it's like, kind of ubiquitous. It is. Yeah. It's crazy in, in movie after movie and backgrounds. Yeah. It's crazy. Uh, we went into the studio in Cleveland, Ohio. Ken Scott, I think it was, uh, it was Ken Scott's studio up in, the, uh, stu in Cleveland. It's like my first time in the studio, and Bill Bartlett, who was formerly with the Lemon Pipers, had put this band together, and we went up there and played Black Betty. And it was a regional hit in Ohio, and then the band broke up. Um, and I went out with Dickie Betts, and they went on. Next thing I know, Black Betty's on the radio nationally, and it really hasn't stopped since. Yeah. It's still there. So, a factoid. We're go. thinking of adding it to the set. We haven't done that yet, but it might be a good idea to add to the set. It's a fun song, man. It is. You get to really show off your licks. Yeah. You? Well, you know. well Bill, Walt, Bill Bartlett was a tremendous guitar player. Yeah. Yeah, the yeah. solos on there are fun. He's Definitely. a tremendous... And the double lines and all that. He's like a Charlie Parker or a John Coltrane of the Telecaster. There you go. He's just so free and just all over the neck and just, 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 it just came out of him. Yeah. And Bill's playing Boogie Woogie now for those... You know, Oh, yeah. So last question, yes. um, and this is actually from the Newberry uh, Opera House. They gave us a list of questions to kind of oh, wow. mull over, and what, I found this one kind of interesting. Do you have any pre-show ritual? A pre-show ritual? Yeah. And I thought about that for the whole band. I was wow. like, oh, I wonder. And yeah, I have my perspective really. on it, do but you, I was wondering. Do you? Do you? Um, I. Don't I think? Uh, I mean, I'm usually just practicing, warming up my hands. All right. Yeah. Um, but it's kind of fun. What I think is funny is we all kind of go, even though we all get along really well and we all hang out and talk. When like right before showtime, we all kind of seem to go off in like our That's respective true. corners. That is so right? true. <laughs> <laughs> and like we just need a moment alone before we're gonna have a few hours of you know that intensity together. It's not like a football team where everybody goes, yeah, yeah. Boom, yeah. You know, it's not like that. No, no. Not at all. Man. We need a little bit of calm before the storm, maybe. Yeah. You know, maybe my, my ritual will be like checking my batteries, checking my tuning, uh, just I don't know, just making sure everything's working. I, yeah. I don't know. That's basically it. You know. To, yeah, it's it's like a real quiet kind of moment right before we go on. Yeah, right. Yeah. So, that's what I noticed. Yeah, and it's more introspective than it is like this outgoing thing. Right. And then you just go out there and give it all you got. You right. Know? That's it. Maybe that we know we're going to be out there for a few hours, just you know, slamming it. That we gotta, we need a moment to prepare. I love all these people on here. Yeah. Like, Who's see. out there? Yeah. Robert. Hey, Robert. Bill. Margaret. Nice. Man, this is awesome. Heather. Heather's on there twice. She must be watching on two machines. All right. I don't know how that works. Okay. <laughs> I don't know either. <laughs> so, but, uh, so just reminder, uh, Friday, October 8th, mm -hmm. we'll be starting around 8 o'clock. I believe so. Um, I want to say hi to Melissa, who oh. texted me today from the venue. Hey, hello. Awesome. We're looking forward to being there. And I heard stories about uh, Newberry from the guy who books us up in Dothan. He said that the downtown has been revitalized, and we're actually looking forward to this coming, kind of experiencing it a little bit. We heard that the theater was very much responsible for revitalizing a lot of the downtown, and so we think that's a neat story. So we're going to check out Newberry itself when we get there, we hope. Definitely, definitely. And uh, the one thing to keep in mind is if you are not feeling well and yeah. you're exhibiting COVID symptoms, please do not come. Uh, you know, we want everyone to be healthy and safe survive the show we and, want people to survive yeah the show. so yes. everyone's health and safety is very important to us and to the newberry opera house um, but for everyone else we hope to see you there and let's have a great time for everyone else your survival matters too no we're yeah. just kidding hey thanks we'll, we'll see you bye y'all